The regular meeting of the Charter Commission's even year elections work group will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to this virtual meeting of the Charter Commission's even year elections work group. This meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statutes section 13 D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public awareness and transparency. The meeting is public and subject to the open meeting law. For the record, my name is Jan Sandberg. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Charter Commission's Even Year Elections Workgroup, and I will now call this meeting in order to order and ask the clerk to please call the roll so that we may verify the presence of a quorum. Commissioner Ginder. Present. Commissioner Hawkins. Present. Commissioner Kozak. Here. Commissioner Perry. Here. Commissioner Smith. Here. Co-chair Clegg. Here. And co-chair Sandberg. Present. There are seven members present. Let the record reflect that we do have a quorum and we'll now proceed to our agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative management information system, which is available at limbs.minneapolismn.gov. Commissioners, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. May I please have a motion to adopt the agenda? Move, Terry. And a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion before the clerk calls the roll? Seeing none, will the current clerk please call the roll on that motion? Commissioner Ginder? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Kozak? Aye. Commissioner Perry? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Co-Chair Clegg? Aye. And Co-Chair Sandberg? Aye. There are seven ayes. Thank you. That motion passes. The agenda is adopted. Commissioners, there is one set of minutes to accept from our meeting on March 22nd, 2020. May I please have a motion to accept those minutes? Move to approve, Clegg. Is there a second? Second, Perry. Thank you. Is there any discussion before the clerk calls the roll? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll on that motion. Commissioner Ginder? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Kozak? Aye. Commissioner Perry? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Co-Chair Clegg? Aye. And co-chair Sandberg. Aye. There are seven ayes. That motion passes. The minutes are accepted. And next is the chair's report. I have nothing to report that's not going to be discussed further on in the agenda. I would ask co-chair Clegg if he has anything to add. Nothing to report. Thank you. Thank you. OK, item five on the agenda is considering the policy implications of holding municipal elections during even numbered years. Um, we know there are also some technical and legal issues, but for today's meeting, we thought we would focus on whether in fact this is good policy and we should consider moving forward. There were a few items that were sent to you and they are in the agenda packet available to the public um, that you should all have in front of you. And of course, you may have other ideas to add to this list. I would ask that we just kind of move through it at this point and you add your items at the end if that would work out. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Commissioner Ginder for kindly suggesting some of these and also providing a number of references so that uh, commissioners could become more familiar with those topics. Having said that uh, on this item, we broke it into three sections, uh, implications for voters, implications for candidates, and then other issues that is kind of at the end of discussion. Oh, thank you very much there. And there's the list on the screen. So um, I guess the best way to proceed is maybe to go through them item by item. Some may not require much discussion. Uh, if others have a different way to proceed, that would be fine with me. But the first item would be whether in fact this would increase turnout for local elections and if that is a good idea. 
and I suspect we all agree that it is a good idea to have more people voting in general, uh, but I would look to commissioners to see if they have any comments on this item, whether increased turnout would be a positive policy implication. I, Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, Who is that? Commissioner Kozak. You know, you're not you're not showing. Oh, wait. OK. There I I see Commis yeah, Commissioner Kozak, I see you're you are. Speaking. There, there you are. <laughs> I agree that certainly the turnout would increase if we had it in an even year. But I think we also have to factor in. And I think we talked about this. Someone mentioned this last time. Uh, the drop off. There's, there, there would, there would probably, there was going to be a drop off from the, uh, from the higher, from the offices like governor, senator, uh, Congress, uh, for Congress. As we get down the ballot, the votes tend to drop off, and there, and I think we have to factor that in in our, in our uh, thinking, because uh, it could be significant, and I think there have been studies done. In uh, in other jurisdictions, which have a a, a really long ballot like this. Okay, uh, and I would point out that that is item number four on our list that we're going to look at. And in fact, I believe some of Commissioner Ginder's references go into some detail on that. So you're absolutely right. I think oh, oh, if we could just discuss that in more detail a little bit further sure. on. Oh, that would I'm be sorry. Great. Yeah, oh, I, I do see. Yeah, I, I didn't. I don't. I don't think I ever heard it called roll off. So. Drop off. Okay, uh, and Commissioner hey, Clegg, you. I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, mine also relates to this same issue, so I'll I'll wait until we get to either whether it's called roll off, drop off. I've always called it ballot fatigue. But, uh, <laughs> I, I think we could use all three terms if we wanted to, and that would be fine. <laughs> okay, but just I think there's just general understanding and agreement that if we switch to an even year election, we'd probably have more people voting. And in general, that's most people would view that as a good thing. So I'm just going to go on uh, to the and you know, we can just open this up for general discussion to see how people feel because I think it's kind of artificial to go do it item by item. Um, so if you would like to have more discussion about the um, I think we had one item here is would we have different composition of people who are voting? And my only thought on that one was we talked about, and I believe Clerk Carl one time gave us a presentation on the downside of uh, having um, uh, open seat, uh, having citywide seats that you do get different people voting citywide than you might get in a specific ward. Is there an issue with that for larger elections? Do you get a different group of voters voting either in terms of socioeconomic or racial composition? And um, I'm not sure. I'm getting a message on my thing about bad network quality. Um, and are you hearing me? I can hear yes. you fine. OK, I have no idea what's going on with my computer. OK, I'll just ignore it now. Anyway, um, so let's just open it up for general vote discussion about voters. And Chair Clegg's hand is still up, but I think this is the roll off, drop off, blah, blah issue. Uh, do you have any you want to add things, Chair Clegg? Yeah, first I would point us to the study, uh, the Humphrey Institute paper that we all uh, looked at a few years ago that was saved in limbs that I asked everybody to take a look at if they could. And that shows that there is, at least in Minneapolis, there there is an increased BIPOC uh, voter turnout in even year elections. OK, or at least in the last few even year elections. OK, uh, any other discussion about the issue? And I would assume that many of us believe, at least I personally do, that that would be a good thing, uh, but others may disagree. Um, any, I don't, oh, Ms., uh, Commissioner Ginder, I think I see your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Um, one comment on the uh, increased turnout. Uh, which I agree I think is likely to happen. Um, I think one thing that's a little bit different about Minneapolis is that our off-year election turnout is substantially higher than other municipalities that have off-year elections. So if you look at last year's election, which was somewhat um, 
uh, unique, but you know we had a 50% plus turnout of, of, of eligible voters, and that isn't that far off as what we get sometimes in, in governor uh, races. So I agree that there will be an increased turnoff. It's not as big, increased turnout, but it's not as big as you might see in some other cities. For example, where in New York, municipal elections draw roughly 15% the last couple of cycles that they've had those elections. Um, I think that there is, and I agree with Chair Clegg on this also, is that um, there is a likelihood of, uh, in a even year election of grabbing uh, more of the BIPOC voters to come out and uh, vote. Um, but then that flows into the the issue of uh, either voter roll off or ballot roll off as people move down that on the larger elections. So uh, it's something that there's a big balancing going on there. You attract more people, but what percentage of those people um, fall through uh, as the ballot gets longer? Um, so some of those articles are interesting on that. Um, it goes both ways depending on who you read on that. But um, um, I guess my main choice is you will attract more people. How many of them and percentage wise will actually vote in the municipal election um, is something that's a little bit less clear. Okay. And Commissioner Clegg, I think I see your hand up again. Me again. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to point out a couple of things. First of all, with respect to Minneapolis turnout, you can point to any one of the most recent uh, few mayoral elections and explain why the turnout was higher than it normally is. You have to look all the way back to 2009 to find a mayoral election that was, uh, for the most part, uncontested. And that was a very, very low turnout. So yes, we get higher turnout when there's a contested mayor election or contested ballot question election. But if you look at the mean over a long period of time, it is very significantly lower than an even year uh, voter turnout. Second, at least I would argue, if you look at the literature, some of which Commissioner Ginder provided and some of which was already in our stack, um, I think there's a big difference between, you know, uh, talking about uh, voter fatigue when you've got at the end of the ballot a bunch of judges or maybe ballot questions. I think the sample that the uh, one of the authors wrote about was a ballot question in California providing for government contractors and private contractors, and they noted there was a significant roll off. And I think the roll off would be significantly less if we're talking about mayor and council member. So I think we have to consider what we're looking at when we measure uh, voter fatigue. I don't think it is. It is a one size fits all analysis. Uh, Commissioner Smith, I see your hand up. Yeah, just to follow up on what Chair Clegg said, I guess my key point, I think anything that increases voter participation is good. But in terms of voter drop off, I guess I can only speak with my unscientific poll of one. But I know as I go down the ballot, certainly for judges, if they're uncontested, I typically don't vote on them. There are some offices that I haven't voted on because I just don't know enough about the candidates, and that's my fault. But I guess I, I'm not convinced there would be much voter drop-off for, say, city council races just because they are on the same ballot, perhaps, as a statewide or presidential election. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other comments or questions from members of... Oh, Commissioner Perry, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair Sanders. Uh, uh, what I, Sandberg, what I would say is that uh, the same thing that uh, my previous colleagues have said is I don't think there would be a, signif a significant drop off either. I'd like to see some data um, about that in other jurisdictions, but I think once you've made a commitment to go into the voting booth, there and and there are people running against another candidate when we're talking about judges they're usually uncontested but when we're talking about um, races where there are contested races going on i think people will still participate they've made it that far and i think they'll make the commitment to vote on contested races and i think that's different than judges which are generally uncontested not well documented um, people are in the dark about them and i think they just are I think it's apples to oranges when you're trying to compare those to, say, a city council race or a mayoral race. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, it's a very interesting comment about data from other jurisdictions, and I'm not sure that we have seen that. I would assume you're talking about going to cities that currently have this practice and trying to find data from them. I'm not sure exactly how we would do that, but it, that would be really interesting, I would think. And maybe that's a to do item if we decide to proceed. Commissioner Clegg, of course, has a thought on this. Of course. <laughs> uh, I was just going to point out that the 2018 paper that uh, we looked at noted that Oakland, California uh, also uses ranked choice voting for its municipal elections, and its municipal elections are in even years. And uh, they have a different statutory scheme, obviously, which allows this. But um, the, the drop off in turnout or in, in uh, voter drop off was uh, minimal. Uh, that their characteristics are similar to Minneapolis, same same approximate population and, and same approximate percentage of population that I, identifies as BIPOC. So, mm, OK, thank you. One, one example. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Perry, you had another comment. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up uh, on a somewhat different same topic, but somewhat from a different angle is that um, I think when we look at the turnout in presidential years, and this is based on my assumption that there won't be significant drop off, even if there was significant drop off, I think uh, there's still the turnout in a presidential year would be so significant that it would best our average over the long haul for our uh, municipal elections. And I agree with uh, Chair Clegg that if you look at more recent races and municipal races, um, or more more recent municipal elections, that there will be, there is a higher turnout, but um, I think those are the exception, not the rule. So. I'm just thinking if 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 we went forward with this, my recommendation would be to put it in a presidential year to maximize the turnout. Okay, and that's down under number C, but I'm making a note. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Rubenstein, you're a guest, but we'd love to hear your comments. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I was just thinking about this notion of voter fatigue. And, uh, and not so much on the drop off in the ballot itself, but what happens um, in an even year election if all races are even year local and uh, state and federal. Uh, people get fatigued from all the electioneering and of course that can that can work both ways. You get really tired of all the emails and the politicking in the presidential race and in the federal other federal races and then on top of it if you have a ballot question or city council races that's just you know it people get pretty i would think based on my own experience pretty sick of all the electioneering and i don't know whether that speaks for or against this change in election year but i think it's relevant and it, it reminds me of something that um, uh, I think that Commissioner Ginder, one of his articles might have mentioned, which was choice fatigue. And it, but I'm not sure how yes. appropriate it is in Minneapolis where people would just tend to, okay, it's down in the thing, we'll just choose the party that we al align with. But for city elections, for municipal elections, um, well, I guess they do have, they can put something in as to their party, can't they? Somebody, I don't know if there's somebody here from the clerk's office or elections that remembers that detail. I should know I'm an election judge. I just don't remember. They but can put three words. So. Three words in which they that could be suggestive of a specific party. But I think we had glitter rainbow unicorn one year as a party so it doesn't necessarily have to relate to a specific party but i'm wondering if that would get into that whole choice fatigue issue where somebody could benefit from what they thought was the preference i'm not sure anyway just the thought um the item nobody's brought up but uh thanks to commissioner smith we um have some knowledge about is the model charter 
and the model charter apparently mentioned that they were recommending not going to even years and because of uh, it looked like undue influence of partisanship and perhaps Commissioner Smith has more information on it or Commissioner Clegg who has his hand up perhaps has more information. I'll let Commissioner Smith go first if he has any background to provide. Um, I don't think I have, have anything else to add. I did look at that charter provision after Commissioner Ginder brought it up the last time that we met, but I haven't looked at it since. And I guess I don't really remember the the specific reasoning other than what Chair Sandberg has already talked about for the reasons for the preference for an odd year election. Oh, Chair Clay. I wonder if this one needs to be split into two because there was uh, undue partisanship was was an item but also uh, undue influence of special interests, which uh, many of the authors have, have speculated would occur, uh, if which does occur in odd year elections because of voter turnout. So a special interest can have undue influence by money and soliciting support. But just a minute to talk about partisanship. I think this, this would be a risk if, if Minneapolis were uh, the same profile as a national voter, ranging from right-wing Trump voters to left-wing Bernie voters. But in Minneapolis, we're more a little to the right of Bernie to a little to the left of Bernie. So I think we're just a different animal. So I don't think national partisanship would affect um, how Minneapolis perceived the election when you're comparing us to either national or statewide. And thank you for pointing out that this list is defective because it didn't have the comment, the portion for special interests. And it should have, because that's what most people often think of as being a problem with low turnout elections, is that it allows a certain group, whoever that might be, to have a significant influence. We ran in, I've mentioned this before, I used to be on the school board in Bloomington, Minnesota, and we switched our elections from the spring to the fall for that very reason, um, because of the influence of certain groups. Uh, did it help? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Commissioner Ginder has his hand up. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, this special influence kind of cuts it several ways, and it's a really interesting question. I mean, all we have to do is look back at our last election and the amount of money that came in um, on both sides, of, for example, the uh, well, shorthand is defund the police question or change the police, uh, the charter regarding police. A lot of money came in from both sides uh, from out of out of the city. So there's special interest at play. That's not necessarily always bad because it's certainly the amount of money that was spent raised the profile of the issue for those people that showed up to vote. Um, and as you go into some of the later uh, discussions here, um, and it said whether that's good or bad is, is a different question, but that will be lost in a presidential or even a gubernatorial election because the larger issues, I think, will overwhelm that special interest for municipal elections, as well as, um, you know, act as the black hole for all the money and the campaign workers and everything else. So, um, there, like I said, there, it can go both ways on the special interest, good or bad, but it certainly does raise interest in a, in a local election on issues that affect um, the general population. And, and I agree that's true as long as the issue has two sides. In the case of the school board elections in Bloomington, I think the concern was that the teachers union was on one side and, it, and there really wasn't another side. So that's why the thought was to, to shift it so there would be more voters. And but I agree with you. I think having information for voters is a great idea. We should do it more often. Uh, Commissioner Perry, once again. Yeah, I, I, I agree mostly with uh, Commissioner Ginder, but I would say that um, to look at last year particularly, I think even if that was held, if the question two was. Um, in a presidential year, it still would have gotten a lot of money and a lot of voter attention. Um, I think that was just so high on people's minds um, and there was so much influence going on with that, that I don't think that would have gotten washed out from a, uh, a presidential campaign. 
and Commissioner Clegg. Once again, um, I don't think question two is a good example of, um, you know, outsized undue influence of of special interest because there were so many people that voted on it. Uh, probably as many people as would have voted on it even during an even year. What I would be more concerned about is in a low turnout council election, for example, a few hundred votes is enough to to swing the election for most of them. So uh, in a very small election, small turnout election like that, it would be easy for a special interest group to go out and, and find a relatively small number of votes that would tilt the election. Right, and last year I think it could be argued that there was a confounding effect between the city council races and some of the ballot questions, so which made it even more interesting, I suppose. Um, all right, so are there any other issues under voters that we want to discuss right now before we move on to the candidate issues? And seeing no hands, the next section deals with, and this was brought up last time, I think by some of the people who are here today, um, what impact would switching have on the candidates and their campaigns and so forth? And I can't remember who brought it up. It was probably Commissioner Kozak, not sure. But if this is the whole idea of how much more difficult would it be to run a local city council mayoral campaign? Would it be more expensive? Would they have problems getting people to work the campaigns and what else? Um, so if anybody has comments about that issue, or is there just general agreement it might be more expensive for can campaigns? Uh, Commissioner Clegg, you, I can see you. I'm just thinking that's an issue we need to do more study on. Okay, um, yeah, I, there, I can't there obviously find lots of municipalities that hold their elections in even years, and somehow they manage to find the money and the election workers, but um, we don't really have any data on that. All we have right now is anecdotal. Oh no, I agree. We have no data on whether it's a barrier. I think we probably figure out it would be a it would be a bit of a challenge for them, but I I don't think it, we could tell, say one way or the other about that. I see Commissioner Perry's face. Yes, I I was just going to say the same thing that just like the on the voters. I think um, if we could put a an action item for for us to look at other jurisdictions and what they what is the effect of having um, elections in even years and how they deal with the campaign workers and money. Um, I don't know if, um, again, I don't know if that would lead to a more expensive race, but I would be curious. I, I think we need data here. That sounds like something you're volunteering to do, Commissioner Perry. <laughs> and the, Commissioner Kozak, I see your face too. Great. Oh, um, I I don't remember whether it was me that brought this up last time, but uh, just coincidentally, I had a conversation today with a uh, uh, somebody who's running one of the caucus uh, efforts at the legislature this year to get to get the to get the majority. And he said the biggest problem they're having is labor, is getting, is hiring people, uh, field workers to go out there and do the door knocking. So uh, that has nothing to do with an even, with even year. It's just, a, he said, given the labor market, and I, obviously that, that changes from time to time, but he said they're really having a hard time recruiting people to to go out and do the and do the work and of course uh to get them they're going to have to pay more money so it, it might be a chronic problem no matter what the circumstances okay thank you uh any other comments on the candidate issue although it sounds like we really need to do more work to figure out what's going on in that area and if not we can move to the third section which is other uh, we've already had one comment. I think that it should be to a presidential year. Is there any thought about if it makes a difference? Presidential, non-presidential, any concerns with that? And I'm not seeing any. So uh, the last, the second and third item on there came up during our discussions previously 
with. I think we often think of this as a way of saving money for the government, but I'm not so sure that was what we saw in uh, Clerk Carl's presentation last time. It sounded like there might be costs, additional costs to the city to run elections during those years. Uh, if in fact we have these complications from rank choice voting. So I didn't know if there were any other issues to consider here. And and seeing Commissioner Perry's face again. Yeah, so I, I'm curious. Um, I This did come out of the presentation by staff, but um, I'm curious what an election costs. What does it cost to run an election in any particular year? I, th I think we would have to ask them to bring that back to us. I thought, so oh boy, I'm probably not going to remember this pro properly. There was an issue if they drop elections, some years have no, more years have no elections in them. That can affect the staffing in the elections office to some extent. Mm. Uh, might be make it more difficult for them to keep full time staff over longer periods of time. I'm I'm going to wait to hear from Clerk Carl about this at our next meeting, assuming we have one. Um, okay. The other issue was that the ballot processing for ranked choice voting, as you know, is still not as straightforward as we would like it because the software isn't there. They use a series of spreadsheets and so forth, but that takes time. And the more votes there are in because of how they have to prove them, I think could be a cost, but I would I will let the elections people tell us that it's not. Unfortunately, if we had the software, so everything was done by machine, that wouldn't be an issue. But right now, I don't think we were there yet, and I'm not getting a feeling that we're going to be there in the immediate future, so I don't know, but we'll ask. I, I would love to see a breakdown of what the costs are. Okay. OK, let me put this in and I know Mr. Dean is listening in here somewhere, so um, I guess I think our next issue is are we interested in moving forward with this to now to next? I assume the next meeting because we didn't give them warning to have a presentation ready that we wish to pursue this issue and we want a more detailed look at one legal. And then two technical. And you, we might want to break those down and do the legal first and then the technical. I'm not sure. Uh, but is there a consensus that we want to move forward? And yes, Commissioner Perry, I see you. Your hand. Yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm not speaking for a consensus, but I'll speak for myself is that I would love to to move forward on this and have an additional meeting and look at the legal aspects. OK, and. Does anybody else have strong feelings one way or another? They'd like to have an opinion like Commissioner Smith. Yeah, I was just going to say I agree as well that we ought, ought to move forward. OK, and would you agree that we should first tackle legal issues and then or we could maybe do them both in the same meeting? I don't know how the staff feels about that. Yeah, if we could do both in the same meeting, I'm, I guess in some ways it might make sense to do the legal issues first, just because if there was some reason legally that we couldn't do it, then the other issues don't really matter. OK, and Commissioner Ginder has his hand up and then I'll go to the other faces that I see. Um, I, I'm not opposed to moving this forward, but I think as we move it forward, we should also um, at the same time we have any presentation, whether it's legal or uh, some of the technical from staff, we should also get the uh, some information on the topics that we were just raised about uh, campaign impacts, uh, availability of uh, of uh, uh, people to work on campaigns as well as the cost and that kind of thing to put this all together um, so you can weigh the policy versus the legal versus the technical um, you know in a unified version but i i certainly agree that there's enough to look at to continue to move this forward i mean it's, it's i think it's a complicated issue but i i do agree that we should continue to move forward with it okay so what i hear from you is move forward with looking at legal and technical, but also circle back to some of the issues that were just raised in the last few minutes. And Commissioner Clegg. Yes, thank you. I agree we should um, continue to move forward. I have a request for Commissioner Ginder. One of the um, citations you gave was to an article by Sarah Anzia of Stanford University. And if you go to the link for that page, you can just get to the first page of the article and then you have to be a member, it looks like, to access the whole thing. So I'm wondering if you could um, 
if you if you have access to the whole thing, if you could PDF it around. Uh, Chair, I don't have access to the whole thing. Um, it, I, my recollection is that has to be entered or requested through a school or a college or something like that, as well as the cost. So um, I, I'll have to look at that further. But I know the article referring to you are referring to to see if we can get the full article rather than just the abstract. Great. And I'm wondering also if we can build a resource page like we have on, with past uh, work groups and include, for example, all of the references that uh, Commissioner Ginder gave us in that uh, resource list, as well as the uh, items we looked at in 2017, 18, which are already there. So we have the beginnings of it, but let's add Commissioner Ginder's uh, citations. Let's add the bullet point um, a PowerPoint presentation we got from okay. election staff at our last meeting and continue to build on that. And I would assume that uh, Maddie, the clerk's office would be in charge of putting that together. I believe you did that the last time when we did the run control page, as I recall. And I think Maddie would have access to all of those references right now. I don't know where Maddie is. Yes, co-chair Sandberg, I can start getting together a clerk file and put what I've got there now and then distribute it to all of you and see if there's anything else we need to add. Oh, that's very good. OK, um, I, I chair click. I'm not sure how you would like to proceed. I don't know if we need a motion to move forward or just general. That we want to move forward. Sounds to me like there's consensus. OK, then um, I think so, so you and I will work together to determine a date for a next meeting. Maybe maybe we'll be able to have a meeting where we are in person first. <laughs> I think we're running out of time. I'm understanding that our meeting tomorrow is maybe our last remote meeting. For our group, maybe I don't know. Well, let's Maddie, so. you have any information on that? Um, I think that is likely what's happening at this time, but there will still be more information to come from the clerk's office on the exact transition date. Oh, goody. OK. <laughs> uh, yes, Commissioner. Sure. Yeah, so I'm on another board and we were told by the clerk's office that the council made a decision to go back to meeting in person on the 11th of this month at their G March 24th meeting and that boards and commissions would be going back to meeting in person on the 18th of April. And so I know the other board that I sit on meets on the 21st, so we will be meeting in person on the 21st of April. And that's, I believe that, that's were, what the clerk told us. And I think you were also told that the hybrid option was off the table. Right, that's correct. But we'll wait to hear more because who knows? They might surprise us. OK, um, all right, so um, we will work together uh, with Chuck Clegg to come up with a date for another meeting and we'll see what it's like. The focus is on legal and technical, but also circle back and pull in some of the questions that were raised by uh, work group members a little bit earlier. And if you have other issues that you think need to be addressed, would you please send your questions to Chair Clegg and myself and we'll we'll put them together in the agenda and any articles that anyone finds that you think are good, please share with us and with Maddie so we can start putting together this resource page. OK, is that sound about right? I guess so. So. I got to go find my script. With that, we've concluded all the business to come before the Charter Commission's even year elections work group and without objection, we stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>